Welcome back to Trending in Education, our special Mother's Day edition. I'm very pleased to be joined by my wife and the mother of my child, Robin Naughton. Robin. Hi. Well, welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited to be on the show. Yeah, and just to be clear, for our diehard listeners, you have been on Trending in Education one time before. This was back in August of 2017 during the first season of The Citadel. We, yes. were, ta we were talking about Game of Thrones. We were at the podcast movement conference in Anaheim, California, and we recorded that episode from our hotel room, which was pretty exciting. So you got some bona fides. This is not your first flight on the big jet liner, the jumbo liner <laughs> that is trending in education. Uh, but this is the first time we're going to talk uh, a little more about education because that was talking more about uh, Game of Thrones. Yes. Uh, for those uh, fans, go back, listen to that one. There was, there was some fun action. But, uh, but yeah, this is your first time on an official trending in education show. How does it feel? It feels great. I'm yeah. really excited. It's a good opportunity to talk to you guys. I had fun on that last show. It was nice when I was on that one time to talk a little bit about Game of Thrones and the Blue Fire, which was pretty nice. Yeah, so we were talking about dragons. and But today we wanted to talk, uh, you know, a little bit about Mother's Day. We had a nice Mother's Day together, so so that was fun. We had Matthew out in Brooklyn. Uh, Matthew is our son and uh, got a nice stroll in. Finally, the weather is getting better and we were practicing good social distancing. We were wearing our masks and uh, got a nice day out. How did it feel? This is your second... Mother's, mother's Day, mother's yeah. day as, as a mother. You had many as other mothers. As a mother, mother yes. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've had a lot of Mother's Days where I was not a mother. Correct. I, I, I wish my mother a happy Mother's Day. And I think yeah. it felt really good to be a mother on Mother's Day. And it's the second year, which is great. And we were fortunate today, too, to you know have my mother here as well, which yes. is really nice. So I could wish her Happy Mother's Day, and then I got wished Happy Mother's Day. So it was kind of a very nice day. And we took a really nice, wonderful walk into Red Hook and had some good lunch out there and discover some spaces that we hadn't discovered before. So I think that's, that's really great. Yeah, Red Hook, Brooklyn. You know, Brooklyn continues to surprise us. And Brooklyn is coming back, too. For those of you who are yeah. wondering how Brooklyn's doing, Brooklyn, obviously very hard times. And our, our sympathy goes out to everyone who was impacted by the, the COVID pandemic, which did hit the borough and the city of New York very hard. But it is nice to be out to see how resilient uh, the people of New York are, the people of Brooklyn are, and to participate in that a little bit. And to celebrate a little bit of Mother's Day doesn't hurt. So, so that was great. And then what we wanted to talk about, in addition to uh, anything you've learned in terms of your, your motherhood, is to talk about a couple things. We wanted to talk about the role of librarianship and libraries, information mm -hmm. science. And then yeah. I thought we could touch a little bit on introversion, because I know that's something you and I have talked about uh, a decent amount. And then just try to understand how the the pandemic is impacting different types of different types of personalities in different ways so so i think big picture that's what we wanted to talk about but for you can you talk a little bit about your experience and your your expertise you also have an e-learning background too yes. so we'll try to keep it condensed you know because yes. your cv could could fill up an entire episode but, but can yes. you can you give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do Yes, absolutely. So my background is in information science, most recently. I started as an English major at Brooklyn College in New York, and I've worked in e-learning. And out of e-learning, I decided to um, go back and get my PhD in user experience and user research. So I have a PhD in information science with a focus on human-computer interaction, and specifically focused on user-centered design and user experience research. 
Currently, I am running digital for the New York Academy of Medicine Library. And what this means is that I develop a, a digital lab and I manage a digitization program. So one of the things libraries are doing are cultural heritage institutions in general are digitizing their materials. And the library that I work for has amazing and very unique materials. So one of the things that I do is really try to digitize them. And we do a variety of mass digitization projects. This can be a commercial vendor project where we digitize hundreds of thousands of items and make it available. One of the recent projects we did was with Gale publishers who really did a big public health project, which is a very valuable project today. That project right now, today, when we think about it, the fact that we've digitized so much material for it and it's available and users can get to that content today as we're going through this public health crisis is really relevant and really important to see that you know some of the things that a lot of people are talking about is 1918 epidemic yeah. and the flu epidemic and we have digitized that materials mm -hmm. coming out of that 1980 flu epidemic so there's a lot that you can go in and get and learn from and see what was happening then and what's happening now how those things compare yep. other things that we've digitized in our in-house lab i built a lab so that we can digitize materials that are rare and unique that really can't leave the building and so we'll talk a little bit about how libraries are dealing with the fact that a part of what they do has very much to do in the physical realm and being a digital librarian or running digital for a library you are an intermediary in this world of digital and physical because mm -hmm. physical is a really important piece of a library. So for example, when we digitize in-house, you are literally taking the book off the shelf and going through all these processes to digitize a rare book. Mm -hmm. And that process, you know, takes a lot of resources and time and focus and concerns for the actual text because rare books you want to make sure some of them are very fragile so you, you need to make sure that you're doing the processes in such a way that you protect the book so it can continue to live on and one of the reasons we digitize as well is so that this material can get out to the public and available to the public and it also helps the text because if it's rare and fragile you don't want too many hands on it right. so you have a digitized version that you can use as well and others can use whether they come to the library or not yep yep so that that was a great introduction lots going on at the new york academy of medicine where you're heading up their digital program you, you kind of touched on it a little bit but one of the big changes in light of the pandemic is that People can't go to libraries these days. And we have yeah. talked on previous episodes. Uh, we've had Angela Seifer on a couple times to talk about digital inclusion mm -hmm. and the key role that libraries play in communities. Any thoughts on how the pandemic is changing things and how it may lead more towards uh, digital librarianship and an evolution of the way librarians think about uh, their roles? Yeah, so I, I think this is really forcing libraries to think about digital in a way that they have not thus far. Many libraries have started to think about digital and have started to digitize their materials, but also just the, the function of doing certain jobs, remote capacities, it's very different. So certain jobs within a library are very much about the physical. Certain things you have to use the book, you have to uh, get the books and librarians um, I'm, I'm on a community call every week or every other week and some of the, the struggles with this new the pandemic and being remote and working remote is figuring out what things can you do remotely that you used to do in the office is mm -hmm. can that translate so some of the jobs can easily translate and some of it just cannot and also it is forcing libraries to think about what can be digital and what processes can be adjusted and they're 
certainly some processes that can be adjusted, but it is a difficult time right now, particularly for librarians in thinking about these sorts of things, because some of the work that they do, especially libraries who are basically on the front lines, they're the ones who are speaking to the patrons, they're doing reference work, they're doing these kinds of things. There has always been kind of remote reference, but now that is hatched up a bit, you know, because that is the way you can help. So if you go to many of the libraries or cultural and student websites, you'll see that they're saying you can call us from remote or you can email us and we will help you with your questions and we'll still do the research that we can do. Mm -hmm. One of the things this also highlights is that some of the research that um, librarians reach out to, to help patrons with are not digital. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to do that kind of reference work because the the materials are in the library are in the stacks and and you you have to go to the physical object to do it mm -hmm. so there is a negotiation in there and thinking about going forward what are some things that can be more digital in terms of helping with reference or right. and what things it's just the way it is so right. I do think there are some challenges involved in what's happening today, but the librarians are really working towards being different. For example, the reference librarian at my library is now thinking about ways to do tours, doing remote tours mm -hmm. via Zoom or via PowerPoint and really trying to use images that have already been digitized and then doing maybe an audio overlay or some media with it to get people the kind of tours that they would enjoy physically that she does on a regular basis. But mm -hmm. now that it's remote, can we do those kinds of things? Right. Um, it's interesting too, because it reminds me of, we talked a bit about emergency remote teaching where teachers had to suddenly shift their entire curriculum, their entire teaching to remote, to digital. Mm -hmm. And it does seem like some of what you're describing now is a little bit of that emergency response, but it is interesting to think about how this will be in the future coming out of this, where in some ways it's an argument for more digital work, which has been the, the main focus that you've had, although I was happy yeah. you, talk, you talked about the stacks, because you like to talk yeah. about the stacks uh, of books that are in the historical medical library yeah. that the New York Academy of Medicine has. Uh, really interesting tomes and rare <laughs> books there, beautiful rare book room, which, which we could talk about maybe down the road. But it's really interesting to think about how that's really locked into a physical location yes. when it could be more readily accessible through digital. And uh, we've also talked about how the pandemic has really accelerated the move to working from home, yes. to telemedicine, and to telehealth. Yes. Is there a similar concept in libraries? Is it a telelibrary or is there a term of art around the digital side of librarianship that, that may see uh, renaissance, if you will, in light of uh, the, 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 this new thinking that the pandemic is driving? Well, I think in terms of the digital library, I think that this pandemic will drive the uptake in digital. Digital has been growing in libraries in the last few decades. And one of the things that this highlighted is the need for more digital and more flexibility in work arrangements and so forth. The other thing that you pointed out when you talk about e-learning and emergency remote teaching, libraries also have to deal with that, particularly the ad academic librarians. One of the challenges is very much how do we respond to our students in this time? And, and libraries, academic libraries throughout are looking at ways. Some of them may have already started to do remote before this happened, and some of them have not. And so as a result of that, the, the, the pandemic has really created a shift in the thinking about how they will do um, library instruction. How, how are they going to teach um, students? How are they going to teach particular classes or support faculty in the work that they're trying to do? And libraries have always been a space where the digital and the learning happens and it mm -hmm. continues to happen. And I think coming out of this pandemic, it will happen even more. The, the footprint of digital will increase because the need for it is very clearly obvious today. Mm -hmm. and 
And if you have not been working towards it, you must today. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, tomorrow, when things are shifted back to what the new normal is, Mm -hmm. then that will not go back. It, It just cannot because there's so much that um, librarians do and that remote would help. And some librarians are discovering that what they've been doing, they could do remotely. And Mm -hmm. so I think administrations, library administrations have to think about what that means. It's particularly when the return to work happens, it may be a staggered kind of return to work. So Mm -hmm. some people will have to go in because their jobs require them to physically do things. And some people can have a hybrid solution or Mm -hmm. some people can go remote completely. For digital librarians, remote completely is always an option because much of their work is already digital, so they don't need to physically be there. Interesting stuff. You mentioned the public health side of things, like being at a medical library that has the historical collection and then also a role in public policy around uh, public health in the city of New York is, is really interesting. And how do you make those sorts of resources available. Particularly, we were talking about some of the work that the Academy's done recently around the the Spanish flu pandemic in the early 20th century that hit New York pretty hard. And there's a really interesting collection at the New York Academy of Medicine. I believe you're doing some stuff with that too, correct? Yes. Yeah, so the Academy of Medicine is really focused on public health, and the, one of the the groups, the research researchers, are focused on you know public health policy and really getting public health and health equity, which is a, uh, our mission is really to focus on health equity and bringing health equity, making sure people have equal opportunity and equity. The library has focused on the history of medicine and public health, and it has a really robust historical collection. And the collection that I spoke about earlier, it was a collection on the Committee on Public Health. And the Committee on Public Health was the Academy's Committee on Public Health. So this was a committee that really in New York City had an important role to play and really worked on developing public health policies and implementing it throughout New York City. And the New York Academy of Medicine have been involved in public health issues and policies throughout its history. And when we digitized the Committee on Public Health, that gave us uh, an opportunity right now to think about, well, can we really do something to highlight some of the information on what the committee did in Mm -hmm. 1918? Mm -hmm. And this is something I'm currently working on. And it's, it's important that we have access to this material and we can share this material because this history really has something to tell us about today and Mm -hmm. what what were the steps that were taken how did we respond to what was happening in 1918 and Mm -hmm. how are we responding today and if you look Throughout the cultural heritage um, community, you will find that a lot of discussion about the 1918, because 1918 flu epidemic is really um, something that we can look to to see what was done. And that's basically 100 years ago that happened. And so throughout cultural community, even if you do a search today, you'll see that many organizations, many libraries, many cultural institutions, history of medicine and public health institutions are starting to showcase and discuss the 1918 um, epidemic and what it means and what lessons we could learn from then. Mm -hmm. Um, It really shines a light on the historical perspective on a lot of these things. And you can see that the questions that we're dealing with, whether to wear a mask, whether to wash your hands, um, Mm -hmm. uh, distancing, and what are some of the things we're dealing with are clearly discussions that happened at that time as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting, especially if you think about the fact that if those resources are digitized, they're available to the world. If they're not digitized, if there's no digital format, they're really only available to people who can get access to the physical library and then access to the actual resource itself. Uh, And as you mentioned, once you have a digital copy preserved, 
it's a lot easier to both preserve the digital copy and preserve the original copy because people can then access the digital version as opposed to the, the physical ver version. So just just showing you that I've been paying attention when you talk, <laughs> talk, talk to me about work, which, which is a good thing. Just to shift gears a little bit, because you know, we want to try to pack as much in. A lot's going on on the library front and a lot, lot that we can continue to talk about and bring you back to wear that hat in the future. But another hat that I think <laughs> you're, you're willing to admit to wearing is the hat of someone who maybe on the uh, introversion side of the introversion extroversion continuum. Yes. And this was one reason why, A, I wanted to get you on the show because I don't think we always hear the voice of introverts maybe as much as we could. And it's pretty easy to find extroverts who are willing and eager to hop on. Although I do think podcasting is an interesting format where I think folks who are maybe a little more introverted, uh, I tend to view myself as a, a vert or an ambivert. I'm right in between an extra introvert and an extrovert. And a lot of what I've read has uh, indicated that introversion and extroversion is frequently contextual so that no one yeah. is really 100% one or the other. But as someone who's maybe a little on the introversion side of the equation, I, I think the combination of introversion and digital orientation has in some ways set you up to be able to navigate some of the, the challenges of sheltering at home and dealing with the complexity of the pandemic response. I also may get you back on in the future <laughs> as, a, as a resident expert on introversion. I know you've read a bunch on it uh, yes. as well. So any thoughts? Ah, uh, yes. I I'm going to have to give like shout out to the introverts here at home reading a book right now. Because I, I, I do think I am on the introvert side of the introversion, extroversion um, still. And being digital and being an introvert, there's a lot that you can do and you can accomplish. I think dealing with, the, with COVID and the shelter at home and the social distancing as an introvert, you were probably doing some of those things anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not rushing out into the extroverted world and dying to be part of large groups. I think some of the things that introverts deal with, particularly at work, there's a lot of meetings and a lot of working with groups of people who are much more extroverted in many cases than you are. And the thing about being an introvert is the idea that you gain your energy from alone time. And that's how you get your energy. So it's not necessary that you don't want to participate in these things. Is that when you do, you need time away as well to build that energy back up. And so I think with the shelter at home, you have that time to build that energy back up. And your uh, chances are pretty good if you're working from home. You are in a lot of Zoom meetings, so you're still kind of participating in the kind of activities that collaboration entails. Mm -hmm. But you can better plan your day a bit and uh, make sure you set aside that time to really get your energy back to where you need it to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a balance that you must try to meet and work with with yourself and with the kind of situation or context you're in right. and, I, and I agree I think it, it, it does depend on context and context is important you know for me I definitely like to get a little bit of time away from everything that's going on just to kind of get my head straight a little bit and focus and get some energy back mm -hmm. um, because throughout the day there's so many things happening that we have a toddler so right, right. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot happening in, in an average day so you know I get a, some of that time to just sit at the end of the day to really say okay I'm just gonna sit here and maybe think a little bit and get organized but being digital I think does help that uh, yeah, yeah it's it's a in some ways it's a it it's a good time to be an introvert and to be a digitally oriented introvert. And at the same time, it is hard. There's some, there's some good articles that we'll probably talk more about in the future about how to manage a truly inclusive uh, Zoom call, as an example. Yes. So meetings frequently revert to some of the same types of dynamics you yes. have in a physical meeting room. 
except on a digital format. And then some of the Zoom meetings that I've been in have had, you know, 20, 25 people in. Just getting a word in edgewise requires you to really jump in and assert yourself. And I think frequently folks who are more on the, uh, the introverted side of the continuum will just choose not to participate. So that is something where good meeting facilitators encourage everybody to contribute and are even comfortable making the more introverted folks in the room, putting them on the spot a bit and in a good way, let them know that we want to hear everyone. We don't want to just hear from the same people who are talking all the time. And um, that was really part of why I wanted to at least touch on this. I think it's a topic, you know, Susan Cain is sort of yeah. the, the, the alpha introvert out <laughs> there. She wrote a book called Quiet, uh, The Power of Introverts in a World that can't stop talking. talking yes as as i can't stop talking here i'd love to okay. maybe get a get a few more words from you on this uh, as yeah. i have i have forced the, <laughs> the, the 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 most important person in my life who happens to be an introvert onto the show to speak a little bit so i'd love to get get a little bit more your your perspective because i think sometimes we don't we don't design the, the world frequently can feel like it's designed for extroverts and you know i'd love to get your perspective on some of that yeah, and I think and Susan Cain's book is awesome. So if you get a chance to read it, feel f just go for it. The, the thing I, I would say, it, it's true in terms of meetings, and this is true whether you have the meetings in person or digitally, you really do need to give people an opportunity to speak because if you have introverts and people who just don't speak up, they, they may have something to say that is important. And a lot of times in meetings, if you have the same few people who are constantly talking, then the other people who may have something to say it may not say it in the meeting, or they may find a different time to say it, or they may never say it. And I think it's important as a facilitator to really give people opportunity to speak. And it's even more important when you're doing these Zoom meetings, because the time is usually very short. And if there's a lot of people on the call, there really is not enough time to let everyone speak. But sometimes you have to make sure that the people who do speak don't take up all the time. Yeah. Um, so you have to make a conscious effort to reach out to them. I also think about this in teaching, because when I was teaching, one of the things you do as a teacher is you really try to call on most of the kids. Mm -hmm. It's the same issue. You'll have the few kids who will always raise their hands and always say something, but you have a good percentage of your students who do not. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher and a facilitator of the discussion, it is up to you to say, we want to hear from you. You may not raise your hands a lot, but I know you have something to say. And I think this is true throughout all these conversations and collaborations. Yeah. Um, it's really important to, to, to take that active step to make yep. sure people are seen and heard. Yeah, and it's important on two fronts. I think one, to make everyone feel valued and included uh, yes. on the one hand, but then on the other hand, a lot of the research has shown that groups who share talk time, groups who are genuinely diverse and are getting perspectives from different folks within their, their broader context, tend to make better decisions, tend to be more effective, tend to be more engaged. And that's true even for the more extroverted folks in yes. the conversation. And there's nothing wrong with extroverts. You know, we, oh, the, no. world, the world needs them just like it needs introverts, just like it needs folks uh, who maybe are in the middle of the pack like myself, it takes all kinds. And it, you know, it's really that, that diversity that ultimately drives, you know, good group process. Another thing I've also, I think I might've heard this from you, Robin, is, you know, allowing folks to contribute in different ways is yes. another really key insight for leaders, really in, in any context, whether you're a teacher, you're leading an organization, or you're just, uh, you know, you're involved in your community in any way, is open up avenues for communication that are not skewed towards extroversion. Encourage folks who may not necessarily feel as comfortable participating by talking to write their notes and share them with the group or spend some time reflecting and then, and then come back. A lot of what I've read about introverts is that, you know, they just want a little bit of time to process before putting their thoughts back out there. And that that's almost runs, you know, directly counter to extroverts who, 
really get excited about the ideas and want to get their, their, their thoughts out in real time and they expect everybody to kind of operate in the same way. So I think a lot of it really comes back down to, to empathy and inclusion and really trying to, trying to tailor your tactics to, to the individual rather than thinking that one size fits everyone. Um, any, any concluding yeah. thoughts on this? I, I will add, particularly when thinking about the pandemic and the shelter at home, I will add for the extroverts because they may be in a situation now where it's hard for them to get their energy back up. Yeah, yeah. You know, so because extroverts need the communication, need that to build up their energy. So they're in kind of an opposite situation today and might be looking for ways to gain their energy and to get that kind of fulfillment. So I think whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, the thing you, you have to think about is what can I do in this time to really keep my energy positive and good? And mm -hmm. how can I help others to do the same? Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and that I believe will, will help us all because we are all kind of dealing with this um, pandemic and the way we approach the world, you know, is, is different for each of us. But the, what we can do, I think, is think of ways that we can help each other be successful in our approach mm -hmm. you know so if you're an introvert and you're like okay i'm getting plenty of en energy rejuvenation <laughs> in my life right now my friend over there is an extrovert is not getting enough maybe those conference calls and those zoom meetings might boost that friend's energy so and then when you're on those calls maybe try to share that kind of discussion and, and, and see how things go. Because mm -hmm. I do think overall, we need these diverse perspectives in all that we do, because the diversity really helps for us to think larger and bigger and come up to solutions, find solutions for challenging situations. And we are in a very challenging situation today. Mm -hmm. And having introverts and extroverts really work with each other and ambiverts of course yeah right <laughs> Come on. yeah, yeah. Um, having us all work together and understand the difference and i think that's the important piece you have to understand that the person across with you may not be of the same disposition as you yeah and and appreciate that understand that that yes. ultimately makes uh, makes the collective stronger you know rather than if everyone's the same you know, the, I always think about that when talking about, you know, board of directors, you know, if there's 12, 61 year old white men in a room, how much value does the 11th or 12th person who is really typed in exactly the same way adding as opposed to if, if that person was not the same age, not the same gender, not the same race, not the same background, you know, it applies to this. We're touching on the, the concept of neurodiversity, which, yeah. which is really seeking out a diverse set, set of like neurological orientations. And, and that's sort of what introversion really is. It's true also for, for many of the other personality inventory things. It's just generally helpful to have a breadth of uh, perspectives. And that's part of why I wanted to get you on the show. So so now you have your second your second show under, yeah. under under your belt. So congratulations on that, Robin, and happy yeah. Mother's Day to you. Happy Mother's Day to all. We're just going to ship tomorrow, so it'll be a day late for everyone. So happy belated Mother's Day to everyone else. Happy Mother's Day to you, Robin. You've been you've been an amazing mom, and it's been uh, a joy to watch you and our son thrive, uh, even despite the <laughs> external challenges we're all facing these days. And also really interesting, if folks want to learn more about librarianship or the New York Academy of Medicine or any of these things, where should they go? What, what, any recommendations if they want to ramp up on the digital library side of things? One of the sites that I created is called Digital Collections at Nyan.org. If you go there, you get to see some of our collections at the library. If you want to reach out to me, I am on Twitter, niam.org. You can find me there. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, you can even ping Trend in Education and they can reach me if, if, if necessary. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. I'm so glad I got an opportunity to come on the show and talk a little bit about some of the things I care about. And I really appreciate it. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there.
Um, and Father's Day is coming. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Dr. Robin Naughton from the New York Academy of Medicine, uh, Information Science, Motherhood, and Introversion all in one. So yeah. thanks very much for attending and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll be back again soon on Trending in Education. Mm-hmm.